Okay, so voices from religious traditions about environmentalism have been evolving since the 1960s with the birth of the modern environmental movement. And broadly, they argue that religions consider nature to be significant beyond its use value to humans and that people ought not to act in ways that harm the natural environment. Religious traditions are considered to provide frameworks for environmental ethics and to support the view that nature should be treated with respect. In addition to this, we also find the argument that notions of the sacredness of the natural world have become lost in the modern era with the emergence of capitalism and industrialization. Humanity is considered to largely have forgotten the sacredness of nature, and this, it is argued, needs to be rediscovered in order to address the contemporary global environmental crisis. This is increasingly noted as an important strategy in the bid to achieve sustainable development globally. An important example of this in terms of a coherent and collective effort by religious traditions are the so-called Assisi declarations. In 1986, representatives of five of the world's major world religions met in Assisi, Italy to make statements concerning the environmental nature of their religious traditions. Okay, so this is the, um, the Buddhist declaration, and as it goes, Buddhism is a religion of love, understanding, and compassion, and committed towards the ideal of non-violence, and as such, it also attaches great importance to wildlife and the protection of the environment, on which every being in this world depends for survival. From existing sources, there is evidence to suggest that for all their limitations, people in the past were aware of this need for harmony between human beings and nature. They loved the environment. They revered it as a source of life and well-being in the world. And these were published, I mean, they've been published in many places, but there's a booklet published by um, WWF where you can read this. They're, they're, they're online as well. And uh, this is the Hindu declaration, or this is just parts of the declarations. In the ancient spiritual traditions, man was looked upon as part of nature, linked by indissoluble spiritual and psychological bonds with the elements around him. This is very much marked in the Hindu tradition, probably the oldest living religious tradition in the world. The natural environment also received the close attention of the ancient Hindu scriptures. Forests and groves were considered as sacred, and flowering trees received special reverence. The Hindu tradition of reverence for nature and all forms of life, vegetable or animal, represents a powerful tradition which needs to be re-nurtured and reapplied in our contemporary context. Okay. But in contrast to these examples, there are other studies that suggest we should take a more cautious approach. And these argue instead that um, the links between religion and the environment tend to be romanticised, and in practice we should not assume that poor people who practice, for instance, Eastern religious traditions or indigenous religions, which it is often suggested are more amenable to ecological interpretations, are inherent environmentalists. Religious environmentalism is then categorised by these as an example of a post-materialist approach to ecological concerns, rather than one that necessarily has a direct relevance for those most affected by the consequence of environmental destruction and climate change. And here's just a couple of um, short examples. Paul Peterson, for, for instance, argues that claims about the environmental nature of religion are anachronistic projections of modern phenomena onto the screen of tradition. And Lance Nelson has similarly argued that the frequent disregard for the material world in Hinduism as an impediment to spiritual progress is problematic for claims that the tradition is environmentally friendly. Okay, so in this paper, I examine where these religious environmentalist discourses are generated and by whom. I'm interested in the extent to which they reflect romantic, perhaps Western notions of a lost ecological id idyll, an ecological golden age, or whether they have relevance for the poor who are struggling against floods, famines, and droughts. When we find these discourses in developing contexts, to what extent are they more likely to be adopted by an educated middle class, which has been influenced by Western, ecocentric, and perhaps even romantic approaches to environmentalism and sustainable development? Or do they actually have relevance at the grassroots as well? Considering that many people in developing countries are religious, and religion continues in many contexts to have a very strong social and political influence, I am interested in whether or not religion has a particular role to play in achieving sustainable development, and if so, what this would entail.
Okay, so since the report of the Brundtland Commission's, um, our, since the report of the Brundtland Commission, our common future defines sustainable development, and this is on the slide, is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The unsustainability of dominant approaches to, to global development, compounded by concerns over global warming and climate change, have become ever more pressing and evident. Also, the global inequality evident in patterns of suffering and deprivation due to ecological problems caused by current modes of development are clear. Because of a complex range of factors, including poverty, a reliance on the land and geographical location, many of the poor in developing countries are particularly vulnerable to the consequences of ecological destruction. Now, the link between poverty and sustainability is clearly recognised in the UN Millennium Development Goals. These are eight international development goals that all 192 United Nations member states and at least 23 international organisations have agreed to achieve by 2015. And goal number seven is to ensure environmental sustainability. So considering that many people in developing countries are religious and religion continues to have a social and political influence, does religion have a particular role to play in achieving sustainable development? If so, what would this entail? And in, in, in the pursuit of Millennium Development Goal 7, what role can religion play in biodiversity conservation, the lobbying of governments and industry to adopt more sustainable policies and practices, and appealing to individuals to change their behaviour? Can religion in developing countries have a positive impact on reversing climate change and preserving species, or is this a post-materialist romantic myth that essentialises poor people is inherently environmentalist? In 2010, I published a book um, called, called uh, Biodivinity and Biodiversity, The Limits to Religious Environmentalism, in which I critically assess many of the claims made by so-called religious environmentalists not in terms of the extent to which they can be supported by the texts and theologies, but rather um, in terms of whether or not these theologies are simply too removed from how people live out their traditions or are actually able to live out their traditions. We can make religious traditions support virtually any agenda, but whether or not people are able and willing to translate this into practice is quite another matter. To me, there seemed to be rather a large gap between so-called eco-theology and actual practice. So just some examples on this slide. For instance, in India, within the Hindu tradition, we find many examples of the worship of elements of the natural world that do not necessarily result in behaviour that is directed towards environmental conservation. For instance, while people in India worship the dangerously polluted river Ganges as the goddess Ganga Ma, there is little evidence that this religious practice motivates devotees to engage in initiatives to prevent any further pollution of the river. Similarly, there's a strong tradition of sacred grove preservation in India, yet it can be suggested that people worship these forests because they are the abode of the deity rather than to conserve biodiversity. So the ecocentric or deep ecological view that nature has intrinsic value and humans ought to put the earth first could not necessarily be inferred from these examples of nature religion. Okay, so a number of problems potentially stand in the way of religious environmentalist discourse being a viable strategy for contributing towards sustainable development. So firstly, religious traditions can be interpreted to support contemporary environmentalist thinking, but this does not mean that people who belong to those traditions, either in the past or today, will necessarily think and behave like modern environmentalists. Secondly, while there is often the view in religious environmentalism that ancient peoples worshipped elements of the natural world because they were aware of their ecological value, we cannot assume this. Thirdly, whereas modern environmentalists consider the whole of nature is relevant and worthy of respect, many examples of so-called nature religion are only focused on certain aspects of the environment, for instance, particular trees, forests, or rivers. And fourthly, are religious environmentalist discourse is part of the so-called full-belly environmentalism of the post-materialist or bourgeois environmentalist 
who has typically been exposed to Western globalised environmentalist discourses, including deep ecology, ecocentrism, is affluent and more likely to be concerned with nature for its leisure potential or aesthetic value. So my concern is that this myth of primitive ecological wisdom, consisting of romanticised discourses about how poor people's religion contributes to the way that they relate to their ecological systems, can result in forms of essentialism and reductionism that bear little resemblance to real lives and could undermine already precarious survival strategies. However, while these are, in my view, very significant concerns, the world is rarely so simple. As Kay Milton notes, the myth of primitive ecological wisdom is not simply a notion imposed by romantic environmentalists on a sector of the world's population, but is also an image which indigenous peoples accept and promote for themselves. Peter Brosius is also critical of the tendency to portray as a myth the idea that indigenous peoples lived in harmony with nature. He argues that we need to distinguish between strategic and romantic essentialisms, since historically marginalized communities have begun to recognize the potential potency of strategically deployed essentialisms. So where we find environmentalists and environmental groups in, in, the, in developing contexts articulating their concerns within a religious framework, the extent to which strategic essentialisms are at play need to be considered. Okay, in the final sections of this paper, and this is going to be a, going to be a longer version of what I'm presenting now, I return to um, the question posed at the outset concerning the role that religion could play in achieving the Millennium Development Goal, well, particularly Millennium Development Goal 7. And my aim is to look at the different aspects of the religious engagement with sustainable development and to address the ways in which they can avoid the problems already outlined. So I identify four dimensions of uh, religious significant or engagement. And the first three I'm going to go through quite quickly, and the fourth one I'll look at in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the first one. Eco-theology. So, so this is the first sort of dimension of the relationship between religious environmentalism and sustainable development. So eco-theology, it's already suggested, eco-theology can serve as the basis for strategic essentialisms. And we can find examples where it underpins, for instance, the activities and initiatives of faith-based organisations engaged with sustainable development, involved in practical activities as well as the lobbying of governments and industry. However, as I've already stated, my primary concern here is who is doing the interpreting and for whom. As discussed already, the ecological uh, interpretation of religious texts and traditions can idealise and romanticise the past, and there's a danger of feeding into the myth of primitive ecological wisdom and essentialising poor people as close to nature due to the impact of their religious traditions. Uh, my second um, engagement or interaction involves examining the statements of religious leaders and figures and asking what role they might play in terms of local communities and also at an international level um, in these debates. And often these statements um, may give it the impression of romanticizing the role of religion in the past and today. They may, may well be part of an elite bourgeois environmentalism. And in addition, these religious elites say, for instance, that the World Bank or the United Nations invite to come and talk about the significance of the Millennium Development Goals for their religious traditions are typically male, actually. Um, female representatives of religious traditions are few and, you know, not thin on the ground and don't often get invited to these high-level meetings. So there's a gender issue here as well that needs consideration. However, religious leaders, influential figures within religious traditions can have an influence on government and industry and also mobilise significant resources for campaigns and other activities. My third um, engagement is concerned with organisations and initiatives underpinned by religion engagement with the environment. Now, many organisations, from small local NGOs to the large multilaterals, are beginning to draw upon religious teachings and practices in their activities to encourage people to act in ways that are more sustainable, as well as to protect diversity. 
Um, and a good example of this is the Alliance for Religions and Conservation, which is based in Manchester in the UK and grew from the Assisi event in 1986 and now supports, it's got a wonderful website if anyone's, I mean, I'm sure many of you have looked at it, but they support so many projects um, internationally combining religion and um, sustainability. An ARC describes itself as um, a secular body that helps the major religions of the world to develop their own environmental programs based on their own core teachings, beliefs and practices. We help the religions link with key environmental organisations, creating powerful alliances between faith communities and conservation groups. Now, the engagement of multilateral organisations such as the World Bank and the UNDP, who are involved in projects directly with ARC, um, suggests a desire to seriously consider the contribution that religions might make to Millennium Development Goal 7 at the levels of individual behaviour, local environmental conservation, and the lobbying of industry and governments to adopt more sustainable policies and practices. Religious places of worship and faith-based organisations can potentially play a significant role in sustainable development. But what needs to be avoided in these interactions is the essentialization of poor people as inherently environmentalist, particularly those who live close to the land and whose religious traditions are often intertwined with nature worship of different types. And this is what I'm going to look at um, in my final section in a bit more detail. Examples of communities whose practices seem to suggest a positive relationship between religion and conservation. So one area where this has um, become a focus is with respect to the preservation of sacred groves, protected because of their religious significance, but now recognised by some secular organisations as potential reservoirs of biodiversity. Scientists and environmental organisations are increasingly calling for the protection of these areas, particularly considering that in many places they've, become radi they've radically declined in recent decades. And this has resulted in arguments that the religious practices sustaining these areas should be strengthened, as well as the areas should uh, be protected in law. Now, while we cannot assume that people connected to sacred groves are necessarily modern environmentalists, we, we should not and we should not romanticise these groves as vast repositories of biodiversity. This, this isn't always the case. It does nonetheless seem relevant to assess the extent to which some sacred groves might play a role in modern conservation strategies and how people's traditional beliefs about them can be channeled into sustainable development initiatives. There are increasing numbers of organisations and ecologists interested in sacred groves because of a scientific and almost you know, very pragmatic interest in conservation. And the scientific community and conservation bodies are beginning to take this system of indigenous nature preservation um, seriously. Okay, so two global instruments have been implemented by UNESCO that protect many environmentally important sites. And the first of these is the program on man and the biosphere with its network, its world network of biosphere reserves. And uh, the second is the World Heritage Convention, including the World Heritage List. Both instruments recognize that sacred sites may make a, a significant contribution to nature conservation. The Man and Biosphere programme was launched in the early 1970s and aims to combine biodiversity conservation with sustainable development through close cooperation with communities, taking advantage of traditional knowledge, indigenous products and appropriate land management. Now it's intended that local people should be closely involved in negotiating the creation of the Biosphere Reserve and um, that its creation needs to incorporate human activities rather than to prevent people from using the reserve. And this is achieved through a process of zoning. So we have a core zone where biodiversity is protected, a buffer zone where activities are allowed that are compatible with conservation, so things like research, monitoring, education and training, and a transition area where sustainable development is permitted. And in the mid-1990s, this programme introduced an initiative that looks at the ways in which traditional beliefs and cultural values impact on environmental conservation, and in particular how they may be used to support the protection of legally protected areas such as national parks. Now, the second um, instrument, the World Heritage Convention, was adopted in 1972, and in 1992, a category of cultural landscapes 
was added and paved the way for the incorporation of sacred natural sites. And a number of sites have um, made it onto the World Heritage List. These are here on the slide, some of them. Now, a report published in 2003 drawing on the proceedings from an international workshop organised by UNESCO on the importance of sacred natural sites for biodiversity conservation outlines case studies that focused on traditional mechanisms of environmental conservation in the different regional contexts of Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin America. And again, this is available online, actually. It's a really interesting um, document. And um, in this... Schaff, who was one of the uh, main researchers and, and organisers of this event, Schaff asks, how can environmental conservation be rendered sustainable without violating perceived and real requirements of people inhabiting an area since time immemorial? Can cultural values and traditional belief systems which respect the environment be a more powerful or at least an equally powerful means to conserve nature than legally protected areas? Such an approach appears promising in many traditional societies of the world, where the concept of a sacred nature is well embedded in societal norms. So he advocates the involvement of natural scientists to study the bio biodiversity in these sacred groves and at other sacred sites, and to assess their significance to surrounding ecosystems. But he also suggests that the involvement of anthropologists is very important, who would be more interested in the ways in which people interact with nature through their religious traditions. So, you know, this isn't just a scientific area, area of interest, it's also an anthropological um, area of interest. And he's, he's calling on more involvement of anthropologists in this sort of work. Now, a SWOT analysis of the evidence presented at the workshop suggests strengths and opportunities, uh, suggests that strengths and opportunities include, and these are on the um, slide, the high, a high conservation value of many sacred natural sites, the added value to conservation of shared community beliefs about preserving sacred natural sites when compared with legal regulation alone, the fact that they often preserve traditional knowledge and the potential they offer for developing ecotourism. So there are, there are lots of, of positives. But um, they also discuss um, some threats and weaknesses, including the fact that they are often not recognised in national policies and legal systems. And the local knowledge with which they are intrinsically linked is not valued as highly as modern science in official circles. And sacred natural sites are not necessarily areas of pristine wilderness with high levels of biodiversity. And they typically have a function beyond conservation with the potential for a clash between conservation priorities and the religious uses of those places. So it's important to note that from a scientific or a secular scientific or conservationist perspective, the study of sacred groves forms one component of a broader concern with sustainable development and the preservation of biodiversity. Religious values in themselves are not generally seen as having any necessary role to play. Although some conservationists who are interested in sacred groves genuinely lament the decline in traditional values about these forests, others are not so concerned and are happy to promote the introduction of secular management programs to preserve the remaining groves. So this instrumentalist perspective has drawn critique that the most positive evaluations of the ecological role of traditional beliefs in preserving sacred places are being advanced for scientific and social purposes that are extrinsic to the beliefs themselves. Moreover, it cannot be assumed that the goals of scientific conservation will necessarily match the cultural and economic needs of local communities, particularly when these deny any interference whatsoever. As Freeman has noted in, in his work on sacred groves in Kerala in India, different degrees of human interference in sacred groves may well be accommodated within the cultural framework of the grove as the deities preserve. In the context of his research in Ghana on sacred groves, Barre heard reports of animosity between local people and protected areas because of the exclusionary approach to protected area management. While, and this is to quote, sacred groves are endogenous protected areas which gives them a margin of community acceptance to conserve the groves in tandem with local communities, conservators must resist the temptation to annex the groves for proper conservation. 
Although the majority of respondents in the study area were accepting of the need for outside assistance in conserving the groves, they were also clear that their religious and cultural beliefs should not take second place. And this is a final quotation from uh, Barry's research, and, and, and they write, Often, researchers romanticise culture and assume that once the objective is to preserve culture, there will be zero opposition from local communities. Failure to grasp the centrality of religious and cultural beliefs for locals could, well, could derail well-meaning, potentially mutually beneficial efforts. So perhaps, again, underscoring the need for more anthropological research on the nature of the significance of these groves and, and how they relate to um, ecology and how they could best be incorporated into initiatives around sustainable development. So just to sum up very briefly, um, my aim in this paper has been to demonstrate some of the potential problems with religious environmentalism, particularly when certain assumptions are made about the links between ecological interpretations of religion and environmentalist behaviour, or between instances of nature religion and their ecological significance. Nonetheless, religion does have a role to play in initiatives and activities for sustainable development, but this is not one that can be easy, easily captured by outsiders looking for a quick fix to development problems. Instead, bringing religion into sustainable development requires careful engagement with local communities and organisation, organisations that avoid imposing an outsider view of the role that religion can play and that also avoids prioritising an instrumentalist conservative, conserv, conserv, conservationist ethic. <laughs> okay, conservative ethic. I've finished. <laughs>